Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where we study history so you don't have to. For much of recorded history, people used horses for long-distance travel. Once horses became valuable, it didn't take long for horse thieves to arrive. When the automobile appeared in the late 19th century, it revolutionized transportation. It also created another type of theft. As soon as cars were on the roads, thieves appeared to steal them. Airplanes are not immune to this trend. Today we are going to tell you the stories of several people who stole airplanes and what they did with them. The Alcoholic Pilot Thomas Fitzpatrick was born on April 24, 1930 in New York City. At the age of 15, he lied to a military recruiter about his age. In 1945, Thomas joined the Marines. He was sent to China and fought in the Pacific Theater. The war ended soon after Thomas arrived, but he passed the time by learning how to fly a reconnaissance plane. His skills as a pilot were not valued, and the Marines discharged him in 1947. Thomas didn't care what the Marines thought. He wanted to continue serving his country, so he joined the United States Army. Soon after, the Korean War began. One day, Communist soldiers attacked United States forces. Thomas could see that a nearby group of American soldiers were pinned down by enemy fire. He drove an ammunition truck to their location, saving the soldiers. In the process, Thomas was wounded. Now that his military career was finally over, Thomas Fitzpatrick returned to civilian life. He worked as a steam fitter, which is someone who assembles industrial piping systems. He also loved to drink. On September 30th, 1956, Thomas was consuming liquor at a local bar. After becoming very drunk, he made a bet that he could travel from New Jersey to New York in just 15 minutes. Somebody accepted the offer and Thomas moved quickly to secure his victory. He went to Teterboro Airport in New Jersey and stole a single engine airplane. Thomas didn't turn on any lights or bother using the radio. Around 3 a.m. he took off, flew to the bar where he was drinking earlier, then landed the plane on the street. The plane's owner was impressed and refused to press charges. Thomas had to pay a $100 fine, but was otherwise not punished. On October 4th, 1958, he was drinking again at a different bar. A patron refused to believe that Thomas stole a plane previously. The man needed to be taught a lesson. So Thomas returned to the airport in New Jersey and stole another plane. He again landed it on the street in front of a bar. This time he was sentenced to six months in prison. Thomas never stole another airplane. He died of cancer on September 14, 2009 at the age of 79. The Baggage Handler Richard Russell was born around 1990 in Key West, Florida. He moved to Alaska when he was seven years old. Around 2010, he met Hannah, who would become his wife. In 2015, they moved to Sumner, Washington to be closer to her family. Richard began working as a baggage handler at the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. His life seemed to be relatively happy and stable, but it wouldn't stop him from committing one of the strangest criminal acts in aviation history. On August 10th, 2018, Richard began his shift as usual, but around 7 p.m. he drove to one of the planes that was sitting at the end of a runway. He boarded the plane and began moving it into position for takeoff. Nobody noticed that Richard was stealing an aircraft at first, but as his plane started speeding down the tarmac, an air traffic controller tried to get him to respond. After becoming airborne, Richard finally spoke to the controller. He explained what he planned to do with the stolen plane. I just kind of want to do a couple maneuvers, see what it can do before I put her down, you know. He left the Seattle area and turned towards Mount Rainier. Richard was out of radio contact and off radar for some time. When he reappeared, he had apparently encountered turbulence. He contacted the air traffic controller and said, Sorry, my mic came up. I threw up a little bit. 
After experiencing how dangerous flight could be, Richard seemed to be interested in landing his stolen plane. The controller tried to get him to land at a nearby runway, but Richard became paranoid that the military was going to attack him. Once he refused to land, that fear became justified. The Air Force scrambled two F-15 fighter jets to intercept Richard. They carried missiles that could destroy the rogue aircraft if necessary. Richard turned his plane in the direction of the Olympic Mountains. Then he began speaking on the radio in a very somber tone. I got a lot of people that care about me, and it's going to disappoint them to hear that I did this. I'm just a broken guy. Got a few screws loose, I guess. Never really knew it till now. As Richard tried to figure out what he wanted to do, government officials were also determining their best course of action. Secretary of Defense James Mattis met top military leaders to decide the fate of the stolen plane and its pilot. The saga would end before they could reach a decision. Around 8.30 p.m., Richard's voice came over the radio again. He announced that he wanted to do a barrel roll, then would call it a night. To everyone's surprise, he successfully rolled the aircraft without crashing. A few minutes later, his last transmission was received. Uh, I feel like one of my engines is going out or something. Richard then deliberately crashed into the forest below. The plane was destroyed and he was killed. The FBI interviewed his friends and family. They never did figure out why Richard killed himself. Also, he did not take flying lessons. Nobody is sure how he was able to fly the plane for as long as he did. The Barefoot Bandit Colton Harris Moore was born in Mount Vernon, Washington on March 22, 1991. He spent most of his childhood at his mother's home on Kamano Island. His childhood was quite disturbing. The name his mother gave him, Colton, was in honor of Colt 45 beer. She was very fond of it and drank it daily. When Colton was 12 years old, his father began choking him. Colton succeeded in calling 911 before being choked to death. His father was later convicted of assault. Colton's mother was furious at him for calling emergency services. His love affair with crime began at the age of seven. He would break into vacation homes on the island and steal supplies, then he would disappear into the forest for days. He kept doing this for years and the police couldn't catch him. After years of break-ins and stolen possessions, residents were fed up with Colton and his criminal tendencies. The police were essentially helpless and couldn't stop him. In February 2007, it looked like there might be an opportunity to stop the crime wave. Colton broke into a house, but the next door neighbor was home. The police were called and they finally arrested him. Colton was sentenced to three years in a juvenile facility, but in April 2008, he escaped. Instead of returning home, he went to San Juan Islands. While there, he stole everything he could. Colton would break homes, grocery stores, and delis. He also did it while barefoot and tended to leave footprints at the scene. He became known as the Barefoot Bandit. One night, Colton stole a credit card and used it to order a DVD called How to Fly a Small Aircraft. Then, in the fall of 2008, he put the knowledge to use. Colton broke into a hangar and stole a single-engine Cessna. He flew to a field outside Yakima, Washington, then crashed. Amazingly, he walked away unhurt. He hopped a train to Reno, Nevada and stayed there for six months. But then, on September 11, 2009, Colton returned to Washington State. He stole another plane and made a nighttime landing on Orcas Island. After stealing two airplanes and evading the law, Colton Harris Moore was famous. Several Facebook fan groups were created. They began selling t-shirts reading, Fly Colton Fly. Colton stole another airplane in Idaho several months later. The Department of Homeland Security located the airplane, but when they approached it, Colton shot at them. They retreated, but the United States government was now determined to capture him. 
In February 2010, he stole his fourth airplane. After receiving a tip about where he might be, the FBI launched a raid that included several armed agents and helicopters. Somehow, while being surrounded, Colton escaped arrest. They found footprints in the mud in the shape of his bare feet. Law enforcement spent the next few months looking for him, but they couldn't catch Colton. He began stealing cars and traveling across the country. The FBI was always one step behind. On July 4th, 2010, Colton stole a Cessna from an airport in Bloomington, Indiana. He crashed the plane on the shore of Great Abaco Island in the Bahamas. He again escaped unhurt. Colton then began breaking into homes and stole whatever he could. He also started taking boats to travel from island to island. On July 11, 2010, he was finally captured. Just before dawn, police were searching the docks on Harbor Island. Colton saw them, then jumped into a boat and took off. The police chased him and shot at the engine in his boat until it stopped. Colton Harris Moore was finally arrested. On December 16, 2011, he was sentenced to seven years in prison. In July 2016, he was released on parole. After being released from prison, Colton started a social media campaign to raise money for flight school. His parole officer made him stop. Red Square Landing Matthias Rust was born on June 1, 1968 in West Germany. He earned his pilot's license at 18 years old. Matthias was also an idealistic young man. He wasn't a fan of the Soviet Union. He also thought their air defenses were not very impressive. Matthias decided to prove his theory by flying to Moscow. On May 13, 1987, he rented a Cessna. Matthias then removed most of the seats and replaced them with auxiliary fuel tanks. He spent the next two weeks touring around Northern Europe. On May 28, 1987, he stopped to refuel in Helsinki. Matthias told air traffic control that he was going to Stockholm. Soon after leaving, he turned off his radio and instead traveled in the direction of Moscow. About two hours after takeoff, Matthias entered Soviet airspace. He didn't respond to radio communications and was marked as hostile. He was being tracked by radar and had numerous missiles aimed at his airplane. The operators in charge of the missile batteries kept asking for permission to launch, but nobody would give it. Two fighters were launched to intercept Matthias. When they saw him and asked for permission to engage, it was denied. Soon after, they lost sight of his aircraft. As he traveled through Soviet territory, Matthias kept appearing on air defense radar. The radar systems were supposed to show which aircraft were friends and which were enemies, but a setting was turned on, which showed all planes as friendly. This meant the Soviet defenders couldn't identify Matthias or do anything to stop him. He arrived in Moscow around 7 p.m. At first, Matthias wanted to land in the Kremlin. He decided that the KGB might kill him if he did that, so he decided to land in Red Square instead. Heavy pedestrian traffic forced Matthias to change his mind at the last moment. He finally landed on the Bolshoi Moskvoretsky Bridge. Locals surrounded him and began asking Matthias for his autograph. Despite the newfound fame, he was arrested two hours later. In September 1987, Matthias was put on trial and sentenced to four years in a labor camp. He was never actually sent to the camp. In August 1988, he was released as a sign of goodwill to the West. The reputation of the Soviet military was permanently damaged by this event. Journalists interviewed Matthias to try to understand his motivation. One of them said that he was psychologically unstable and unworldly in a dangerous manner. Unfortunately, Matthias did not blossom into a well-adjusted, productive member of society. In 1989, he propositioned a female co-worker. When she rejected him, he stabbed her. She almost died, and Matthias was sent to jail for two years. In 2001, he was convicted of shoplifting. In 2005, he was found guilty of fraud and had to pay a fine. In 2012, Matthias told journalists that he was now a professional poker player. 
are your thoughts on airplane thieves? Are they despicable human beings or just adventure seekers who go too far? Tell us what you think in the comments below. We need your feedback because we're pitiful, lonely, wretched creatures. Also, it helps make sure that others might see the episodes too. So hit that like button if you want to make sure more people suffer as you have. If you want to encourage us to keep doing whatever it is we're doing, then consider becoming a patron. Links to this and our merchandise are in the video description below. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.